Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the first of two webinars hosted by the Lung Health Foundation on medicinal cannabis. My name is Jennifer McKinnon, and I'm the Senior Manager of Professional Education and Clinical Practice. In February 2020, the Ontario Lung Association became the Lung Health Foundation. The Lung Health Foundation is dedicated to ending gaps in the prevention, diagnosis, and care of lung disease in Canada. We invest in the future by driving groundbreaking research and giving our patients and their families the programs and support they need. Today's talk is titled Med Medicinal Cannabis in Treating Symptoms of Lung Cancer. Before I introduce our speaker, please note that all participants have been muted for the duration of the presentation. Please use the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen to submit questions, and we will be addressing questions at the end of the presentation. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. Dr. Martin Chasen is the Medical Director of Palliative Care at William Osler Health System in Brampton. He was previously Medical Director of Palliative Care at the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Center and the Palliative Rehabilitation Program at Elizabeth Bure Hospital in Ottawa. His undergraduate training in medicine and surgery was at the University of Pretoria in 1983. Later, he obtained a specialist degree in internal medicine and medical oncology, as well as a Master of Philosophy in Palliative Medicine at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Dr. Chasen is founding member of the Palliative Care Working Group and faculty member of education at the European Society of Medical Oncology. He holds professorships at the Universities of Toronto, McMaster, Ottawa, and McGill. He has in excess of 100 peer-reviewed publications, abstracts, and book chapters. Dr. Chasen lectures internationally on cancer patient rehabilitation and approaches to treatment. Thank you so much, Dr. Chasen, for being here, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Well, good afternoon to everybody, and to thank you to Jennifer and, and your whole team for inviting me to participate in these seminars. Um, I feel it's uh, moving forward, you know, from COVID. This was all stuff that we were, we were hoping that we would achieve at the beginning of the year and it was put on to hold. And now that we coming back to kind of normality, although it will never be completely like it was before, I think it's a necessity to, to, to move on. And I think we treating symptoms in patients with cancer and specific with lung cancer is a, a very, very important topic. You know, we, um, I often tell my patients um, that oncologists treat lung cancer and uh, palliative care physicians and nurses treat patients with lung cancer. And so by doing that, we're treating the symptoms so that the patient will be responding to the treatments of the anti-cancer treatments, but also in addition, having some form of therapy that can address the most common symptoms that patients with lung cancer have. So I, I'm going to actually start off by seeing, telling you what the objectives are. And today we're going to speak about cannabis and the cannabinoid system. <clears throat> and I'm going to start off by giving you some kind of an understanding of the endocannabinoid system, which is one of the oldest um, entities within the, in the body, not only the human body, but in animals as well. And then give you what we know of the existing evidence regarding the use of cannabis um, for pain and for some of the other troublesome symptoms that patients with advanced cancer have. And then just recognize the potential side effects that cannabis can produce in people. Um, and then also what are the relative or absolute contraindications to using the, this group of drugs. Just to disclose that I um, have had adv advisory commissions from Tetra Bio and hopefully they will start a trial. We were hoping to start in this year um, in 2020, but it will probably be a lot later It'll be in 2022 and now. So, medical cannabis in Canada is really defined as a dried cannabis, cannabis oil. We can see that over the past good few years, and this is until 2017, that the uh, amount of registered users has almost tripled. And I think by now it's gone up a lot more now that we've also have this legalized. It's mainly used for chronic pain. And um, majority of people, um, whether they prescribe it or whether they would, will use it, 
do want more education and guidance. And I think it's based on this is that uh, one of you know the reason that these webinars and seminars are, are ongoing. So let's just speak about um, some of the active ingredients in cannabis. And we know that uh, THC produces many of the adverse effects um, and, the, and the, the good effects of, of cannabis that are psychoactive. The primary psychoactive ingredient is tetrahydrocannabinol. And uh, depending on which formulation by which company, we see that there is a certain percentage of cannabidiol, the CBD, which is also now beginning to, to feature as one of the main constituents in treating symptoms. I now just saw an advert the other day that one can get hemp, which is cannabidiol that is purified and that contains no THC and that has effect. Standard medical grade that's plant or synthetic, and I mentioned the synthetic here, is because when you synthesize this drug, you can get quality control. If you just have it in, in the plant, we're never exactly sure how much each species is having, what constitutes uh, constituents it's have, what is the percentage, how much will be absorbed, um, how much has uh, you know, potentially got, um, got some kind of a fungal infection or an infestation. So the synthetic seems to be um, a way that will lead the future of, cannabis, uh, of cannabinoids and cannabis. Um, and at least then you know what you're getting, how much you're getting, and how much will be absorbed and how much will the distribution be. We know that a CBD is also it's the, it's analgesic. It uh, can be neuroprotective, anti-inflammatory, anti-convulsant, anti-spasmodic. And it's some of these uh, effects that one uses when treating patients with advanced cancer who have symptoms. So then what is the cannabis? I think there's more than 400 chemical compounds. I actually was at a, a lecture just recently to hear that there's over a thousand chemical compounds um, that have been isolated. <clears throat> there's about a hundred types of cannabinoids. Some of them are psychoactive. Some of them are active in other ways, but not psychoactively. And then the majority of the compounds actually are not active in any way, but are just part of the organic structure of cannabis. <clears throat> so CBD1 and CBD2 receptors occur naturally in the body. They are located in the central nervous system. They're in the peripheral nervous system. They're in organs and tissues of the body. And CBD2 receptors are located mainly in the immune tissues but can also be found in the central nervous system. So just looking, we can see that the THC is partially agonist at CB1 and CB2 two, two receptors, CB, uh, and then CB as well. CBD has very little affinity for the CB1 and CB2. It can actually inhibit the binding of CB1, and that CBD may bind to other non-cannabinoid receptors found within the body. And I kind of like this diagram I'm going to walk you through it from the top to the bottom because we will then see the various effects that we've all heard about, that we've seen, that we may have experienced. And the ones that I'm so interested myself is if you go cerebral cortex, that's for decision making and cognition and emotional behavior. And we do know that people that go on a high may have some problems with decision making, with emotional Moving forward, the chordate nucleus, and these are important, the learning and the memory system. The learning is influenced as well in the putamen. We see learning as well going down into the hippocampus. The rewards of the substantia nigris. And then, of course, the amygdaloid nuclei, where we know that anxiety, stress, emotion, fear, and pain are registered. These are all areas which, if we put it together, change the perception. Not only that, we see in the dorsal vagal complex that you've got the emesis control, but it's this perception of the symptoms that I believe has a major role in treating the symptoms. Because very often the patients will tell us, you know, we know we had pain, but we could deal with that pain. 
And that fear, we don't have that fear anymore. The fear is still there, but it's not as bad. And that we can deal with that fear. And as we know, pain can be a learned experience. If you don't treat pain, it eventually gets to be chronic pain. And that chronic pain is a learned experience. So these are the CBD1 receptors within the brain probably has a major role in the effective effectiveness of these particular drugs. Now we know that it's called marijuana, marijuana, cannabis is the botanical term and it. There are very many species, just like you get in all types of plants and roses and teas. Some smell the same, some look the same, some taste different, some have different, different chemical contents. So cannabis is really a, a variety of species and subspecies, not just one plant. These are the two main ones. We know the cannabis sativa, which is more the THC related, the, the cannabis indica, which is more CBD molecules. Um, they look different, they smell different, they probably taste different, and they have different side effects and different effects. Briefly, let's speak a little bit about the uh, absorption, the distribution, the metabolism and the elimination, which um, when you're looking at drugs, these are called the pharmacokinetics. We look at the absorption. We know that cannabinoids that are administered via inhalation exhibit very similar properties and pharmacokinetic properties to those that are administered intravenously because after inhalation, peak plasma concentration of both THC and CBD are attained rapidly, usually within three to 10 minutes. And the maximum concentrations are higher relative to oral ingestion. So this would suggest that the bioavailability of THC after inhalation reportedly ranges from between 10 to 35%, and it's attributable to the variety of the inhalation characteristics. How many puffs does the person take? How long does he hold it in? Um, and, 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 and how deep does he in breathe in? So the, as, as well as the different inhalational devices, is this a pipe, is this a joint? Is this a, uh, you know, whatever devices are used. So that depends on how much of the active drug gets into the body. Um, in inhaled CBD has also been reportedly uh, to have an average systemic bioavailability of around 31% and a plasma concentration time profile similar to THC. Now, the pharmacokinetics of vaporized and smoked cannabinoids are comparable to those that are available for oromucosal like the Sativix or the Nabiximols or the Oromucal spray. These are some of the, 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 uh, the tools and the ways that are used in order to bring the cannabinoids into the body with a spray like Sativix. And what actually happens is that you, the, you get a, it's very useful because the symptoms produce rapid relief and high drug uh, uh, plasma drug concentrations because there is no uh, uh, first pass bio effect. That means that in that, if a, if a drug is, is, is ingested, it has to go through the liver first, of which some of the active drug may be removed. Where if it's inhaled or if it's injected, then that first pass effect um, is avoided. Now, the transdermal administration of the cannabinoids avoids that first pass bio effect as well. But because these drugs are extremely hydrophobic, they don't diffuse so well across the, the aqueous, which is uh, the layers of the skin. So the absorption is unpredictable. We don't know what the concentration will be in the blood, and that can be quite dangerous. The cannabinoids moving to the distribution distribute rapidly into the well, well vascularized organs like the lung and the heart and the brain and the liver. Um, and the distribution can be affected by the size of the body and the composition of the body. And this, once again, is important in the elderly who don't really have a lot of fat under their skin. Um, and also the permeability of this tissue barrier, the blood tissue barrier, 
um, depends on how rapidly that drug, the cannabinoid, will be distributed. The other thing is that we notice with patients that have got chronic use that the cannabinoids may actually accumulate in the adipose tissue, in this fatty tissue, and subsequent release and redistribution may result in the persistence of cannabinoid activity for several weeks after the administration. So people that have more adipose tissue tend to release that drug more slowly and therefore have longer levels in the blood than somebody who doesn't have very much fatty tissue. I'll just briefly tell you some about the metabolism of THC and it's predominantly through the liver with the cytochrome P450, commonly known as CYP450. Uh, and there are other uh, isoenzymes like CYP2C9, uh, CYP2C19, CYP3A4, um, and they, they mainly metabolized to the 11-hydroxy-THC and 11-carboxy-THC, which then undergo glucuronidation and subsequently excreted as inactive compounds in the urine as well as the feces. Importantly is that lipophilic THC actually crosses the placenta and is also excreted in human breast milk. So this has always raised a concern about the developing brain in a fetus if it could be affected. Now, on the other hand, CBD, which is also hepatically metabolized primarily by CYP2C19 and CYP3A4, once again being further metabolized and, and excreted via fecal and to a lesser extent, urinary excretion. Elimination um, of the half-life of THC vary, and this is what makes it even more difficult because you have an initial half-life, approximately six minutes, and then a long terminal half-life of 22 hours. So somebody taking a, a, a puff or two of, of the joint will have this initial rush and it, uh, of, of drug going into the blood. It then it dissipates, but it remains around for almost a day. A relatively longer elimination half-life is observed once again in the heavy users. And this is attributable to the slow redistribution from the deep compartments where it's been uh, accumulating, such as the fatty tissues. CBD, likewise, has been reported to have a long terminal half-life, with the average half-life following intravenous dosing of about 24 hours. But there is a variation of about six hours either way. And in and a recent investigation of repeated daily oral, oral administration of CBD elicited an elimination half-life of two to five days. So CBD seems to take a little longer to be excreted through the body uh, as compared to THC. There is a dose uh, response and there's also a, a drug-drug interaction, and very much of this information is unfortunately lacking. So we're not 100% sure at this time, and this does give us a little bit of concern. Uh, for instance, we know that there is an, uh, uh, an interaction with, uh, with, uh, <clears throat> with nicotine and tobacco smoke. Um, so if there's with that, with alcohol, with other recreational drugs, these are, are issues that need to get a great, greater clarification before we can safely say this is a drug that, is, that can be used and that is not caused, doesn't cause too much problem. Sorry about that, it just seems to be coming out on my computer. Okay, so the potential exists for this interaction and both, um, as I said, the cannabis and tobacco smoking both induce there's an enzyme called CYP1A2, and this induction is additive if they smoked together. What are the pharmacodynamics that we look? What are the effects on the body? Are there pathological and behavioral toxicities that we can expect? What are the contraindications? What happens if you co-administer with CBD? And is there any dependence that is documented once using these drugs. 
So the effects that cannabis can produce is definite sedation, and there are significant pharmacodynamic interactions if this drug is administered with other central nervous system depressants. Hypnotics, some of the tricyclic antidepressants, the benzodiazepines, they do enhance the central effects. And in a, in a study of human volunteers, ethanol, alcohol was found to increase the plasma THC level and the subjective effect of smoked cannabis. So if you smoke and you take alcohol, the effect will be heightened. And cannabis use is associated with both pathological and behavioral toxicity. <clears throat> the contraindications to the cannabinoid therapies do and should include significant psychiatric, cardiovascular, renal, and hepatic illness. So if somebody's ill, and this happens in patients with cancer that may have hepatic involvement, this may be a relative contraindication to giving a drug which is otherwise can't do you any harm. THC also produces a dose-dependent performance impairment. Following a single inhaled dose of THC, impairment was the greatest during the first hour after the dose and then declined significantly after two to four hours. So two to four hours a person can still have impairment of cognition, of learning, of memory, of judgment. And the substantial, the substantial cognitive and sarcomocor impairment if the blood concentration exceeds a certain five nanogram per mil. In healthy volunteers, administration of THC produced psychotic symptoms, altered perception, once again speaking of the perception, increased anxiety and cognitive deficits. So there are some people that may respond contrary to what you would think. Cannabinoids can induce tachycardias, probably due to the direct agonism of the, CBD, of the CB1 receptor in cardiac tissue. And cardiac toxicity can also incur because of hypertension. With the co-administration of CBD, it's also shown to actually reduce the THC-associated adverse psychotropic and cardiovascular effects. So in a way, it neutralizes those toxic effects of THC. CBD has been reportedly associated with fatigue, somnolence, potentially compounded by the co-administration CNS active uh, uh, medications. So people taking these kind of drugs, the cannabinoids, must avoid at all possible drugs that affect the central nervous system, that would sedate them, that would calm them down because of this drug interaction and this additive effect of the two drugs when used together. We're often asked, what about people? Can you become dependent on cannabis? So we know that cannabis with a high THC content is associated with the greater severity of addiction relative to those cannabinoids with a low THC content. There was a large nationally represented sample of uh, adults in the United States determined that the lifetime cumulative probability of transitioning from cannabis use to dependence was 8.9% with an increased risk of transition to dependence if there was a history of previous psychiatric or substance dependence comorbidity. So if a person was addicted or had an addictive behavior, there was a greater chance of them developing a codependence. There's limited data really regarding the efficacy and safety of cannabis in patients that are older. This population may indeed benefit from the potential symptomatic and palliative benefits, but in the context of comorbidities, renal dysfunction, liver dysfunction, cardiac dysfunction, as well as polypharmacy with all different uh, uh, central nervous system active drugs, 
the increased cognitive vulnerability we see in patients with dementia, and this can predispose to more severe manifestations of the adverse effects, such as the sedation, or the agitation, or the psychosis. And pharmacokinetic parameters that are influenced by the age, such as reduced hepatic and renal clearance, as well as the relative in, uh, increases in body fat that we see in older people, not really in younger people, people, that this can in fact influence the toxicity, the dependence, the side effect profile, and the efficacy of these drugs. So let's go to the meat of what we're really talking about, and that's cannabis and cancer. The symptoms, is there any evidence that these cannabinoids may in fact be beneficial for patients? So these are symptoms that we see. We do an ESAS, the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale. It assesses pain, fatigue, anxiety, depression, nausea, vomiting, appetite, well-being. All of those typical symptoms that patients with advanced cancer have. So people living with cancer, and that's the idea with palliative care, is it's for the living, it's not for the dying. These people are living, experience these variety of symptoms, either due to the disease or to the treatment, and they increase in intensity over time, which affects the patient as well as the caregiver. And in a meta-analysis, which considered really about 28 studies involving over two and a, almost two and a half thousand patients with chronic pain of various etiologies, including neuropathic pain um, and cancer pain, it was concluded that there was moderate quality evidence to support the use of cannabinoids, either smoked cannabis, the nabixamols, or the dronabinol, which was the oral medication, the drobixanols or the sativex, as an adjunct medication to manage chronic neuropathic pain or cancer pain. So it's not the first line, it's probably not the second line, but it's as an adjunctive measure like we would use um, one of the neuroblockers, <coughs> gabapentin or uh, Lyrica, in addition, to cannabin in addition to opioids to treat patients with cancer, these cannabinoids would play a role as an adjunct to a stronger, more directed analgesic. In a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial in patients suffering from moderate to severe pain due to advanced cancer, it was suggested that higher doses of the THC provided analgesic benefit. These are a, this was a very old trial, done in 1975. And in another trial with patients with intractable cancer pain, an orally administered THC CBD extract, which contained 2.7 milligrams of THC and 2.5 milligrams of CBD by, uh, per dose, was effective as an adjunct treatment for cancer-related pain that was not fully relieved by strong opioids. So this was in 2010. And lastly, in an open-labeled extension phase of that study, improvements in scores for sleep and pain between baseline and after five weeks uh, were noted, but there was worsening of the physical functioning score. So these people, I would imagine, were having progression of their disease, but yet were having improvements in sleep and pain. 33% <clears throat> of patients with advanced cancer have bad sleep. They are insomniacs. They do not sleep at all. And it's really those people that have worse symptoms, including pain, nausea, vomiting, anxiety, depression, etc. So does the, does the lack of sleep make the symptoms worse or are the symptoms worse, therefore causing a lack of sleep? In another clinical trial of opioid-treated patients <clears throat> with intractable chronic cancer pain, there was no significant difference that they found between the placebo and the nabixamol-treated group. That was by uh, Portnoy in 2012. And a recent systematic review with a meta-analysis concluded that oromucosal nabixamols 
really had no effect on pain, sleep problems, or opioid consumptions. And that was just very recent in 2019 by Hauser, which was a little bit worrisome. Let's have a look at this done in 2008 by Dr. Vince Meyer, who works in our, in our division and was a prospective, but it was non-randomized and unblinded observational case series and assessed the effectiveness of nabilone as an adjunct therapy in managing pain and symptoms that patients would have. The majority of the patients were placed on a two milligram daily nabilone dose and pain and opioid use was calculated. And he found that those patients had significantly reduced uh, usage in patients that were taking nabilone as, a patient, as opposed to patients that were not. However, it was not randomized. It was open, it was, it was not double blinded and it was visual, it was open to see that this patient got this and this patient got that. But he did report that it happened. So just remembering that the most common side effects as well of, of, of nabilone was dizziness, confusion, dry mouth, and drowsiness. Symptoms that patients do really not do well on either. In patients having medical cannabis, um, all cancer and anti-cancer treatment related symptoms have shown significant improvements in the Barcella study. And he showed that there was the nausea, vomiting, the mood disorders, the fatigue, weight loss, anorexia, constipation, sexual function, sleep disorders, and itching had improved. But there was no significant side effect as well. People's memories, though, were affected. And also, along with the reduction in pain intensity and opioid dose that he found was present in almost half of those patients. So their patients' symptoms improved, their need for opioid decreased, but they did have memory problems in his specific study. And it was a relatively good study, this Barcella study. So when one asks herself the question, should, be, should cannabis be incorporated into routine treatment of patients? Well, on the one hand it should, and on the other hand it shouldn't. So I don't think we really know properly how to use these drugs, but more importantly, probably what we're not doing is measuring the effect in the right way. Does it help for pain? And sometimes it does. Does it help for nausea? Sometimes it does. But maybe we should be rather looking at the person who has pain, nausea, vomiting, etc., and judging overall which I would call the quality of life, rather than a specific symptom. So in this observational study uh, by Bar Lave, they reported improvement in many cancer-related symptoms and 70% reported improvement in pain control and general well-being. Now, well-being, as we measure on the ESAS, is a very important uh, measurement. Because well-being is the one measurement that can tell you whether the patient will come to the ER in the next month. If you see three consecutive increases in well-being, um, which would there say that the patient's getting worse, those are the patients that go to the ER. So well-being is a very important measurement. In this study, more than 90% smoked and the adverse effects of most of these uh, uh, problems just hold on one second, sorry. Was, uh, sorry, this, the side effect profile of those that smoked um, was mainly fatigue and dizziness. Once again, the dizziness coming out, the fatigue perhaps, but we know patients that have advanced cancer definitely have fatigue. So. A pro prospective cohort study amongst patients with newly diagnosed head and neck cancer revealed that possible there were significant quality of life benefits, which included decreased anxiety, pain, and depression, as well as increased appetite and generalized 
um, feelings of well-being. There's good evidence in cancer-induced nausea and vomiting that nabilone or sesamit and marinol, which is not uh, uh, available in Canada anymore, are indicated for the management of severe nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. And as an adjunct, it's recognized to help for breakthrough management of cancer-induced nausea and vomiting. A meta-analysis showed that dronabinol was better than placebo. Dronabinol was probably equivalent to some of the neuroleptics um, and that it did reduce the nausea and the vomiting. And there were many patients in that study that actually preferred cannabis over other drugs. In anorexia cachexia, we see that half of patients in the, uh, in that, in the Welsh study experienced a lack of appetite and weight loss. And clinical trials with dronabinol and Sativix have modest effects. And in a large phase three clinical study comparing oral cannabis to the oral, T oral THC dose, as well as the placebo, the treatment was well tolerated and patient by these patients having the anorexia cachexia syndrome but no difference was found in appetite or quality of life between the cannabis extract and the placebo or between the cannabis extract and the THC. This was in 2006, but the dose used was rather small. So I know there are a lot of proponents to say that maybe an increased dose will in fact give the patients the munchies. Patients with cancer don't seem to have increased benefit from THC from the anorexia cachexia perspectives. I think that is important. So, nabilone in placebo versus placebo and appetite, the nutritional and the quality of life in patients with advanced non small cell lung cancer. After eight weeks of treatment, patients who had received the nabilone increased their caloric intake and their quality of life significantly as well as having increase in role functioning, emotional functioning, social functioning, pain and insomnia. So once again, some investigators find in a benefit, others not find in a benefit in patients with lung cancer. There are a lot of other studies. There's a, star, a pilot study which had a controlled dosage cannibal, ca cannabis capsule in patients having the cachexia and anorexia syndrome, and they found that patients had less appetite loss after the cannabis treatment. And in a very small study, three of six patients who actually completed a study met the primary endpoint of a 10% weight gain. Once again, just too few patients to come to a conclusion. And in this last study by Brisbane 2011, which is a Canadian trial of which we participated, dronabinol was useful in the palliation of chemosensory alterations. So patients' food tasted better. There was the smell was better. And this led to the enjoyment of food being better and an increased caloric intake. Once again, the perception of patients being altered by cannabis. Some of the adverse effects which we've spoken about include the dizziness, the sedation, dry mouth, heart rate increase. We know that there's different ways to administer it, inhalation, smoking, vaporization, and the vaporization provides effects quite similar to smoking while reducing the exposure to the byproducts of the combustion and possible carcinogens, and this is important. These are the three main drugs, although we know we don't get Marinol in Canada anymore, but Nabilone and Sativix are available. And is there an association between cannabis smoking and lung cancer? And there have been a number of recent reviews and meta-analyses and pooled analyses, and they've looked at the combined effect, and the conclusion of many of these studies is there's no clear association between smoking cannabis and lung cancer, or only a marginally statistically significant association. So 
the jury is still out. If it's just cannabis, it's not tobacco, it may not cause lung cancer. I'm just going to give you some few little slides here showing the medical cannabis in the pain and symptom management on cancer. And this was a chart review that was done on 114 patients who took cannabis or cannabinoid between 2005 and 2012. And this is not as this was said, many patients were using, but were not actually telling that they were using it. And we see that there were multiple symptoms that were treated, pain, sleep, appetite loss, nerve pain, anxiety, stress, depression, these are the usual symptoms of these patients. And we see at the usual low dose, these were the doses, less than one gram, one to three grams, five to uh, four to five, five to 10, and more than 10. And that was usually for patients that had previously been heavy recreational users. And they needed higher doses in order to treat the symptoms. And the magnitude of the benefit that was found in, in this particular study was that appetite loss, weight loss, anxiety, and stress seemed to be relieved by cannabis. This anxiety, the stress, the appetite loss, and the weight loss, whereas other studies, as I showed you, the stressor study did not find a difference, and that was a big study. But once again, perhaps it may have been the dose. These were the adverse effects, dry mouth, lethargy, some confusion, and increased sensation. These were the major side effects in that study. And the side effects of, of cannabis compared to other medications, and this is what patients were saying, is that the side effects of the other drugs, such as the opioids, were much worse. Some said the side effects of cannabis were similar, but I think we can say that the side effects of the other drugs, if they were as effective in treating the pain, appeared to be worse. I think um, that's where I'm going to end off on the study, and I'll be quite happy to take some questions if there are. Hi, uh, Dr. Chasen, thank you so much. Um, it's Jennifer. So uh, one question that has come up um, is around the titration of the dose. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit more about what I've seen, what I've seen in literature or practice guidelines is this principle of starting low and go slow. Maybe you can comment around that and how that titration process might work. Okay, so I think it's exactly like the opioids. You know, the opioid the, uh, receptors within the body as well as the cannabinoid receptors are naturally occurring receptors. And one doesn't want to have a sudden rush of, uh, of medication that blocks these receptors and causes the side effects. So very often this is what is now being put forward is to start with a lower dose of maybe 2.5 of the THC. And it's really the, the, the THC that's causing most of the symptoms. And then to see whether after a few days, um, whether the desired effect is achieved um, or, uh, or is, are there toxicities. So in most of the trials, um, it's either a three-day or a seven-day titration dose increase in order to obtain the, the, the tolerated dose for that patient. Likewise, in the opioids, very often a patient will come in and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take five milligrams of morphine. That's far too much for me. And somebody will come in and say, you know, I'm not getting any relief from 10 milligrams as a starting dose. So there's definite individual variation in absorption. Uh, and uh, as we went through the pharmacokinetics, their body weight, um, and uh, are they taking any other drugs at the same time? So it's individualized, it's starting low, it's going slow. Because if you've seen one person have a psychotic episode from cannabis, you will be frightened. And I've seen two people, they've both been over the age of 70. So I'm very reticent in giving this drug um, to a, an elderly patient. So yes, those titration is, and I think that will be the art of medicine, not just the science of medicine, but it will be an art of medicine. Mm, great. 
Very good. Um, thank you. So you touched on individualized approach and um, another question that came up. Um, and you also mentioned you had an experience with some elderly patients that maybe didn't go so well. When, when it comes to deciding this, it, you know, should we approach this drug with one verse person over another? Is there a standardized approach to deciding that? Like it might work here, it might not work. <coughs> I know there's a lot to learn still, but is it, there is a lot to learn. You know, I think if a person, you, you go through the symptoms that the patient has, and then you look at those symptoms, which is the most bothersome symptom? If it's pain, then to me, the, the standard therapies would be the standard approach to treating pain, because cannabis is not the, the primary approach. Um, you know, you'd use opioids until you would get that pain under control or until the patient would have toxicity. If the pain was not un under control and, the, and, uh, and, and there was toxicity from giving more opioid, you wouldn't want to do that either. So that's where these adjunctive treatments come in. As I said, you know, we have first what, Tylenol, some of the tricyclics, some of the neuroblockers such as, uh, uh, you know, uh, gabapentin or, um, or Lyrica, so, and, or cannabinoids. So I think they come in for there for pain I do find definitely for anxiety that these, uh, these drugs do have a good role. For people that are not sleeping well, they have a good role. So, you know, one can include in, if they have those symptoms. I've not found it particularly helpful for patients that are, that are not eating well, but certainly the, the perception of, uh, of, of the body image, and nobody mentions this, but this is a, a big problem in patients. Um, the, uh, one of the major causes of distress is body image change. A person may have weighed uh, 200 pounds and he was a foreman and he used to shout at everybody and now he weighs 140 pounds and he can't eat properly and he can't speak properly. That's a body image change. I'm giving you a, 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 just an extreme example, but many of our patients say they, they don't want to look in the mirror because of the body image change. And the cannabis does have an effect on that perception as well. So anxiety, perhaps depression, I'm not sure. Um, for, for pain, where the opioids have caused too much toxicity um, and for sleep problems, that's where I have found them to be personally most, most uh, helpful and efficacious. That's great, thank you so much. Um, just one final um, thought. Um, you brought up general well-being as being a very important endpoint. Uh, for studies, and this might be specific to each study, but how are people measuring that? I'm just curious. So if you look on the ESAS, so it's a scale between zero and 10, um, and it's the most, 13 most common symptoms, uh, which would be you know, pain, nausea, vomiting, tiredness, anxiety, depression, uh, shortness of breath, appetite. And in the one of them is well-being, where zero is feeling absolutely fine, and 10 is the worst you could feel as a well-being. And uh, so I think each individual person says, well, what is my well-being at the moment? You know, am I feeling well? Am I feeling bad? So you do have some patients that can have a, a pain score of six or seven out of 10 and have a well-being of two out of 10. So it means there, there's a certain amount of coping. You know, that's, a, that's something else that we need to bring into this whole equation is how is that particular person coping? You know, are they distressed? What is causing their distress? Sometimes the patient can have a psychosocial issue of not having a financial means, and that can be causing him to have a physical symptom of increased pain. So there are a lot of other factors rather than just looking at, you know, what is pain? I mean, pain is total pain. And so well-being plays a role, definitely, in, um, in a patient's perception of where they are and how they're coping. Great. Um, thank you for that. Um, so that, that was our final question. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again, Dr. Chasen, for this uh, presentation and taking time to be with us today. Thank you very much. Um, I want to encourage everyone to join us next week on Monday, October 24th, or sorry, August 24th, sorry, uh, same time um, where we'll cover medicinal cannabis in chronic pain. So uh, I hope you join us then as well. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Chasen, and we'll close off there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take Bye care. now. Bye-bye.